Okay, get underway. Look, thanks very much for joining us and welcome to this Science Media Centre webinar. It's called Getting the Most Out of Science Video. Uh, I'm Peter Griffin, the Director of the Science Media Centre. Uh, here with me, um, we have uh, Asher Finlayson, who's actually dialing in from Auckland. Asher is Head of Video at Fairfax, responsible for all Fairfax's videos, including the videos you see on the Stuff website that's generated by their own videographers, as well as videos sourced from third parties. Uh, and just as a bit of background, Asher has a wealth of experience in this space previously at Al Jazeera, ITN, and Sky News. Now, joining us from Auckland, we've got Will Hine, who's dialing in. Uh, Will is a reporter on One News, and TVNZ science reporter has been for several years now. He's covered all sorts of research-based stories and responded to a lot of breaking news stories, such as the Kaikoura earthquake and last week's falls in Auckland uh, that have had strong science angles. Uh, he was previously at Radio New Zealand and has a print background as well uh, at the Southland Times. Dr. Killis is here with us in Wellington. Hi, is a postdoctoral fellow in urban ecology at Victoria University of Wellington and an advisor at the Wellington City Council. Heidi is a biologist and has been using GPS and miniature cameras to track the movements of domestic cats in Wellington's urban environment. Uh, the video created, which you're going to see today, is based on that research. And here we have Baz Kachion, video producer, director, and trainer who runs workshops for all sorts of organizations uh, on how to get the best out of your smartphone for shooting and editing video. Trained Fairfax reporters in the use of their smartphones for video and we're hosting our upcoming Auckland and Wellington science video workshops we're holding at the end of March. And still are a few places open for that, heavily oversubscribed in Auckland, but particularly Wellington. So go to the Science Media Center website and apply if you're interested in being involved in those. We've also my colleague Dacia Herblock here who's going to be running the briefing. I hear from these speakers, play some videos, and at the end have a Q&A session to save all uh, questions to the end. If you do have a burning question, write into the Q&A box you see on the right-hand side of your screen, little Q&A box as we go along. If anything occurs to you, you want to ask a question, put it in and we'll try and get through as many as we can at the end. But first, I want to give a bit of context as to why we're here and why we're doing this. We put this webinar together because we're hearing all the time from media outlets that we work with that video is increasingly a crucial aspect of their coverage. They want more and better quality video on all sorts of subjects, but science is a strong category for online media outlets particularly. And I think by a couple of things. The first is audience behavior. We're increasingly comfortable consuming visual content, often more so text material. So audience appetites are changing. But so too is the online advertising environment. Pre ads on videos are an important and growing source of revenue for media companies. So paling video content is attractive to advertisers. All of this constitutes a big opportunity for those involved in communicating science and research. In fact, it's a necessity that we all become more adept at communicating the medium of video. Now, the mind-blowing facts, just take YouTube alone. As of January 2017, 300 hours of video were being uploaded to YouTube every minute. Five billion videos were watched on YouTube uh, every single day as of January 2017. In an average month, 8 of 10 18 to 49-year-olds watch YouTube. So we know about the growth of video here in New Zealand. New Zealand last year did some surveys around this, and you'll see on the screen there the results of that, that, that TV still reigns supreme as a way to reach people, a typical day. But that video is incredibly strong in the 5th to 39 age group. And if what is growing, it's all about video. It shows all across all content types, online video is the fast growing in terms of weekly reach. Those including linear TV are fine. So video is increasingly important. What about science and videos? In 2014, Nielsen surveyed New Zealanders about their attitudes towards science and technology. They found that Kiwis trust scientists, are interested in science, they see science and think it's important to their daily lives, but they find it hard to relate to science in their daily lives and are often confused by conflicting information about science. 
that's what the results showed. Most Kiwis get their information about science via the media, newspapers. But again, as you see there in those graphs, online video is a fast-growing category, particularly in the younger demographics. Now, MPT's World Internet Project backs this up, and it's evidence. Uh, it's surveying. It does as well. Evidence of this trend towards video. So, if you're someone trying to communicate research out of a communications office in an institution, there are really compelling reasons to tap into this fast-growing medium. Research CBRF is largely about getting peer-reviewed papers. We know this. It's all about your publication record. But the reality is that much of the world's research is authored by a tiny fraction of the world's researchers. The TV and video is therefore a prime channel for exposure and impact beyond beyond the confines of peer review. The also shows that if you are publishing journal papers, the impact of those papers is greater if you are being quoted in the mainstream media via social media channels. Citations for papers are higher among researchers who get exposed via those channels. Our view, because of all of that conflicting information, that confusing people that Neil Surveys is picking up, we need experts more than ever communicating clearly and effectively, and we see every day the spin-offs doing so has for researchers and their organizations. So that's the New Zealand data and the case we think there is for putting a specific focus on using video to communicate your research. But how does that work in the real world? How researchers and media outlets work more effectively to go to get the most out of video? I should have some insights to give here. I'm going to hand it now to Asher to his view from the facts perspective. Thank you, Dad. Hey, uh, thank you um, everyone for having me along today uh, to today's discussion. It really is great to have the opportunity to talk to you. Uh, interesting listening to Peter's outline at the top there, um, just how uh, the state of the industry is now. Um, and it's right that there is a major focus on video at the moment, more so than ever. But as we grow our video production, um, there's still plenty of room for massive growth. Because in somewhere like Fairfax, we only have very limited resource to be able to uh, reduce the video that that we can in-house. So it's great having um, uh, external partnerships and having uh, coming in from third parties uh, to fill that gap that we just cannot fill ourselves. Um, but you um, have seen that we don't carry a lot of video in the stuff science section, and that's something we'd love to change. Uh, any uh, any help that you can give us is um, is very much appreciated. Uh, preach of the choir, but science really is a great subject. Uh, it's plenty of potential to engage with a wider audience. But a key reason our audience is missing out is because of its accessibility, and Peter touched on that at the very top as well. Uh, we're asked with what's available, but generally when we run a science story, it's not presented in a way that's particularly engaging to the audience. Um, but we can uh, change that, and we're working really hard to do so. Because I'm a regular Einstein, and I'm a bit cheeky, um, I'm up with my very own formula that might help you. Please feel free to place it under peer review, but do know that I only just passed science. So A equals P plus A to the power of 2. Expanding out, if A is accessibility, P is presentation, and I is information, then present your information correctly, make it as accessible as it possibly can be to a wider audience. And get that right, and your engagement go through the roof. Human uh, visual beings, it uh, doesn't matter how good the story is. A pile of text with a generic image at the top, it just doesn't hold anyone's interest for very long. And our metrics back that up. When we have video and images and interactive spread throughout the text, we see a dramatic increase in time spent engaging with those stories. Get further through the article as well. Uh, images on screen there, you'll see um, one on uh, the right uh, is a thousand word block of text with a single stock image. Uh, left uh, is a thousand block again, but it's uh, two videos and these images spattered through as well. I couldn't actually uh, screen cap the, the whole story. It, it ends up getting that long. The one on the left has a much higher engagement score, as, uh, giving people options in how they choose to consume that story, just forcing it one way. So some people will read the story, some people uh, will read the, just the text, some will skip through. Um, we'll just watch the videos. Some people will just have a look at the whole lot. 
It's all about giving them options. So as so we have access to some of the most interesting stories, imagery, and generally you have a monopoly on new discoveries. So how can we help you increase the audience's interest? So let's start with what works out of the ordinary stuff, things that the lay person just wouldn't ever come up with on their own. And that's the key. How do we make the inaccessible accessible to the lay person? The idea to get a story up high on the home page, which is our single biggest promotional space, and, uh, and to make it innately shareable to, so that readers want to share it through their own social accounts. That's spread it. Um, so examples um, of what we know uh, works, uh, especially with our readers, anything underwater, the ocean is such a different world and anything that helps us explore down there without having to get wet ourselves makes the audience happy. Uh, so it's just the same as underwater, only it's even harder to get to. Just think telescopes are our friend. Uh, microscopes, very similar to telescopes. Anything through a microscope is good. In fact, uh, I would just assume that anything with a scope in uh, the title has potential. How could you live in such a beautiful place like New Zealand? But seen, and especially over the past uh, few years, it's a pretty volatile place. Kiwis are intrigued about how all of that affects them with flooding, with uh, with earthquakes, all that uh, kind of natural phenomenon. Uh, uh, and um, I hate to get caught up in the discussion of uh, of, of the internet was uh, was made purely for cat videos. Um, but there's yes, something in that. There is a reason that the internet and cute cats do go so well together. Uh, it shouldn't. It certainly shouldn't be limited to cats. But just keep in mind that anything to do with animals and the quirkier, um, the better. Um, especially if there's some kind of message, which there always would be, um, that you would be trying to get through. Uh, did you know and how we do it? Um, things behind the scenes. Uh, give a look at what the science world is up to. And really the answer is no, we didn't know that. That's cool. Let me share it. And that's the kind of response that you want. Uh, that you guys work with every day. So undoubtedly, um, you're not as amazed as we, the general public, are. Um, so it could just be that all is needed uh, is a simple shift in perspective to try and think about uh, different ways that you might be able to get that information um, that you're studying across the general public. Of course, good stories that fall outside of those categories. I'd absolutely like to hear about them. If you're in a position to provide us with any extra elements yourself, uh, then let's try following these some tips. Uh, some of the do's and don'ts of creating a video with a stuff audience in mind. Um, keep them relatively short. Uh, 60 seconds is a, a, around the average length of a clip on stuff. When you'll find them um, shorter, uh, it's not very often that, uh, that a long video clip will do very well. And that generally comes down to the fact that the audience doesn't have time for that kind of thing. In uh, terms, this is another point that I'm stressing today, and Peter made the, uh, the observation at the very start as well. It's all about making the inaccessible accessible to everyone. Uh, interesting visuals. It doesn't matter if it's video or still imagery. Uh, we prefer moving imagery. Um, it's, it, it, it's just easier to watch. But if there are any video-specific uh, visuals, we, there's no reason that we can't turn stills into video. Um, and we can run through uh, some of the the ways of doing that shortly. Questions if we are creating uh, a video in house out of vision that you have sent to us, um, giving and precise descriptions of what it is that we're looking at, um, you know, how is it relevant and why should we care, that will, very, uh, that will go a long way to helping us um, put together a, a really watchable clip. Um, audio, this is the main difference we're finding between online and broadcast. Um, with mine, a lot of people are now looking at stuff on a mobile device and quite often are looking at it without sound. It's the same uh, looking on your Facebook feed. I know that's about to change very soon where they, they're going to turn on uh, audio as well. Um, but a lot of people are leaving their, their sound off. So to make sure that the videos are working, um, it tells the same kind of story. The narrative is being driven actually without the need for it. Um, but saying that we don't want audio. Uh, it's definitely a nice to have uh, for those people that do watch with sound on, but it's imperative. Uh, and the way we get around that is, is uh, by your text. There's a lot of videos coming through these days on your Facebook feed, um, stuff coming through on uh, on stuff as well. 
Uh, the narrative is very much driven by text on screen, uh, and that works for the video whether there is uh, whether there's audio um, or not. Um, now, an example here. I'll just try and dive into. Have uh, actually uploaded the videos directly to it, or do I need to actually put it on myself? Yeah, if you could, that'd be great. Which one? So uh, the space, the the space one, please, would be good. This is um, the space video that we're about to show you. Will um, that this sort of goes back to that same example I, I brought up previously of how you had a thousand word block of text. Um, you play that uh, if you like now. Um, to just with with the sound down would be good. Okay. There we go. Um, so this one is, uh, goes back to that uh, that space example I was giving earlier, um, and that. Uh, this was the second video down of story. Uh, it was about space junk. And you'll see here that we can play this whole video. It's two minutes long, um, so we might not end up getting the whole way through. But you can watch that video yourself and get everything you possibly need out of it because it's got the text on screen. It's got interesting imagery. Um, it, it's too long, which I would class as being really too long. But if you actually sit there and, and watch the clip, you'll find that it's um, it's really two videos in one as well. Sort of the first part explains uh, how how, um, uh, how how there's all the space junk up in uh, in the atmosphere, um, and then the second part sort of goes through the different types of space junk, and it's really quite interesting stuff. Um, my point here really is is that the whole thing is just uh, it's really nice imagery. It's stuff that we just don't uh, we don't naturally get to ourselves as a uh, as a general audience. Um, and it's the, the whole thing is explained through that text. And story, um, here we go, this moves into the second part now, and it sort of shows you all of the different parts of um, uh, different types of, of space junk. And I found this one really quite interesting myself. Uh, I think that um, the one here also uh, did extremely well on site. Um, that map into the splash, um, which when you're looking at stuff, that's the big picture on the top left. Many people think that's our lead story, but just think of that as uh, more like the magazine cover. Um, the lead story is the one just next to it um, in the centre. Um, but if you can get a story into the splash, you're um, you're absolutely winning because um, that's that's always the um, the biggest, um, the most read story at any one point. Uh, right. So I won't have time talking about the technical side of things because uh, we'll hear from uh, from Baz later on in the seminar. Um, working with the SMC to create a workshop specifically around creating these kinds of videos. Um, as Peter mentioned at the start, we have done a lot of work with Baz in the, uh, over the past couple of years. Um, I used him to train around 400 of our reporters up and down the country. Um, Baz and I are constantly in contact about what's good for us and how he can um, how he can put that into his training um, into his training workshops. So he can really help with the, the technical tips and tricks, and I would definitely recommend attending one of his seminars later on in the year um, if you get the chance to. If we stop that video now, jump on to another good example of what's worked well for us on staff, and I'm sure that you will all remember this one was from um, Kai Calder, uh, Seabed Raised. Uh, have you got that one there? Yeah, yeah, that's all. Again, this one can be played without sound, so I can talk over the top of it if that's cool. So all of this, um, we put our own. We've got a, a few drones around the uh, around the country. Uh, it's a bit of a pet project, and it's going really well. But trying to get a drone to something like this, um, where, especially in the early stages, it, it still doesn't quite work. So. Um, I, I'm sorry if uh, whoever filmed this is on this call. Um, I can't remember exactly who, um, who who gave it to us, but it, we were very appreciative of it. Um, it did extremely well. It gave an amazing thing um, of what was actually going on in these uh, remote parts um, of the tree after such a, um, a devastating um, quake. Again, it really did make, make help that um, make help that story. Uh, even accessible to, to the audience. Uh, and I know that the majority of the other uh, main news networks picked it up as well, and I'd imagine um, that it would have done just as well for them as it did us. Uh, that's the kind of thing that 
that we find really helpful. You see, that was just injury as well. Um, there's no, no um, there were no words over it. The other is a bit of music, um, or even just natural sound, and it worked really well. This here is another one. Uh, this one is this was shot from uh, from one of our drones. One of our visual journalists went down there, um, who we've recently trained up to get a wings badge. Um, he went flying. Uh, oh, this is over the road just north, I think, of Sumner, um, and it's just beautiful. So this is something that we got ourselves. Um, and if you've got a if you've got a story that you're working on that you think could really be, um, you know, this aerial footage could lend a, a real hand to. Uh, feel free to get in contact with us because you know we've we love this area of footage and so does our audience. So we, any chance we can get, uh, we will put it up uh, in mind as well. I mean, it, it just gives you a completely different perspective. And so far as I know, um, we're still the only um, news media outlet. I think actually Will might be able to, uh, to to correct me if I'm wrong, but I think TVNZ might have just got one. Um, but they are, uh, they're really growing. Uh, and popularity. I mean, the the vision that you get out of them is just insane, and um, you know our audience loves it. Um, but where there are going to be more and more of these kinds of things, uh, you yeah, market. If you can get in on the ground floor and provide us with that kind of imagery, um, it would be uh, you would definitely use it. Uh, one other example I wanted to show you was from the Cleveland floods last week. We've got that video as well. Yep, we're all there now. The um. We had two of our pilots last week who just wanted to get stuck in and um, and start creating some really nice imagery out of uh, Cleveland. Um, so I think we had it out there two or three days in a row. This was directly after it had stopped raining. Luckily, there was a bit of a break in the wind, so we could put it up. Uh, and then it closed in again, and then the next day there was even more. Oh, actually, I think it might have even been a few days later. There was even more, and you know, so we we were able to get some pretty amazing footage. Um, again, there was no voiceover on it. There was just a bit of music, I think. Um, so it's all about the um, it's all about the imagery. Uh, kind of footage really complements the article beautifully. It gives a different perspective that most of our um, uh, you know most of our competitors can't. Um, words can describe the amount of water that was there, but as you can see there, it's the aerial footage that really conveys the scale. Um, and this clip here is currently the most viewed clip on stuff so far this month. Uh, closely followed by similar footage um, of uh, other parts of the flooding. Uh, we also had um, another clip that's even gone up again today um, because of the sinkhole that's happened out in um, in West Auckland. Um, so we're using them up and down the country. And um, the other thing I'll say about uh, about drones as well, not to harp on about them uh, much, is that we're also venturing into. I know it's not video specific, but we're venturing into 3D mapping, which I know is something that is uh, is really taking uh, science forward by storm as well. So when I say you're trying to increase that engagement from our audience, um, it's, it's not just stills, it's not just video, it's anything that is interactive. Um, so if we can create a, a 3D map of, of an area that you're studying uh, and we can put annotations on it and things like that, we can embed that within the story and really keep that uh, keep the interactivity up. And like I say, that will increase the engagement. Um, and the last thing I wanted to discuss with you, I think we're, where are we? I'm on this one, aren't I? Mm -hmm. Last thing I want to discuss was that working directly with our stuff, journos. Um, we don't have a designated science editor. We've got a lot of news directors up and down um, the country. They keep an eye um, on the, the SMC press, uh, press releases, um, and our reporters have plenty of good contacts throughout the science world. I'm sure you, uh, everyone on this call, um, a, um, has a report friend, especially within Fairfax, because it's such a, a wide-ranging company. Um, they're the experts at knowing what works well for our audience, um, so the good stories do get picked up. Uh, following on, um, you know, with some of these tips that uh, that I've, I've given you briefly here, and that Baz will teach you later on, and um, and the others here on this um, presentation will give you, um, it, you know, it will certainly go a long way uh, to helping a story going from a run-of-the-mill story to a must-have, and that you really need to be aiming. We've also got um, a very talented projects team. And one of the specialties is turning uh, is turning data into quality interactives and animations as well. And like I said before, it's not it's not video specific, but statistics can be a very visual element in our storytelling. Uh, journalism has become a really big part of what we do, and I'm sure they'd appreciate uh, the chance to work with you on, on helping make those statistics work visually. What springs to mind was from one of the press re media releases just 
uh, yesterday or the day before uh, about there was a wastewater study revealing that meth is the most commonly used drug in Auckland. Uh, I thought that was an absolutely genius study and the, the fact that you were able to um, to work out uh, you know what what the best, what the most used drug in uh, in Auckland was you know just by studying the wastewater. I mean, I suppose it makes sense when you think about it, but I would never have thought to do that. And I think that all of the data, um, you know, would have really helped turn that story um, if you interact with it in some way. Uh, that would have really helped turn that story from that blog text of a few hundred words that it was with a, it was just a general file picture at the top. I can guarantee you that if there was an interactive um, click or a video up there, um, it would generate a much more uh, interesting and a much um, higher audience. And that's the point of doing it. So that's really helpful. I hope there's a few tips in there. Um, I'm always available as well. I'm sure that my uh, details will be sent out to everyone from, um, from Peter and co. Um, so if you do have a, an interesting story that you want to share, feel free to get in touch with me directly. Thank you. Uh, we can hand over now to Will. Um, if you do have questions that um, Ash's presentation something like that, put them in the Q&A box now. We're going to answer as many as we can uh, at the end of the webinar. So over to you, Will. Um, thanks for this, everyone. Uh, it's, it's great to talk about this sort of thing. I get a lot of queries from scientists and researchers about what sort of uh, video works uh, for television, what can be fixed in the field and what should be uh, recorded by researchers uh, a way that can help them get their story uh, onto telly or onto the web or, or what have you. Um, I'm going to keep it basic. I just want to talk mainly about how you can assemble footage uh, that can be incorporated into a news broadcast that's perhaps profiling at your work, and um, I'll, I'll come to the story that I want to show you in a minute. But the thing I want you to bear in mind, essentially, is that we want things done simply. Um, raw footage, which isn't too overtreated, uh, is fantastic for us. Simple, basic shots um, that help capture the story that we can add to uh, later on with our own uh, cameraman uh, and what have you. Um, as Ash has said there, uh, we we have as well, and we can bring those in our cameras out to the field and do stuff with you. But there's a lot of material that only you will be able to, to shoot. Um, I often talk to scientists, and they say to me, Oh, you should have been here when, or I wish I had a camera back then, or they try to describe something which happened, and they tell me they've deleted the photos they took on their iPhone of said great event, uh, which isn't much. So um, I just want to give you a few tips as to how you can um, get uh, the footage needed, preferably footage, but stills work fantastically well as uh, as well. Um, so without any further ado, a few pieces you can put on this, this demo video. Um, the one thing I'd want people to look for here is just to sort of separate the shots that Searcher has taken themselves and the shots that we brought to bring along our camera. Okay, I'll that now. Well, assuming I'll just let it play for a little while, I think. Yep, then enough, Peter, if you want to sit there or stop it there. Okay. So I don't know you wanted to pull this clip out, which is a bit old now, I think it's about three years old, um, was that 
the footage obtained by the researcher was very simple. There was nothing fantastic about it, but it did its job perfectly from our point of view. It, um, it caught all the action. And importantly, uh, this story would not have been done without that footage. Um, we have the means and resources to take away an Attenborough-style crew into the, the bus to wait for uh, the mating habits of the giraffe weevil to become up and over a matter of hours or days or, or, or probably weeks. Um, so had you been put it, put it in, this is one that would have had to have probably uh, remained a story for radio or print. Um, so in this instance, it was critical that the, the researcher um, used the camera to get the shots, and um, she did it very well. Uh, also, point here, point out there that the Campbell story was uh, sort of at the simpler end of the spectrum for it involved just the footage brought by the researcher, uh, coupled with some we took in the laboratory there, plus a single interview. So for us. That was the, the very easy end of the spectrum. It wasn't a multi show, but it wasn't in multiple locations, but it all been viable uh, with Chrissy presenting that sort of footage. Um, I'll just go back to the second now, if we can. Peter, is that you staring that, Peter? Um, and, and I sort of have um, a few tips, I guess, as to how you can obtain similar results. Um, the first thing I would say is don't worry about the quality of your equipment. We're often given footage from the likes of Niwa and Genius and different pictures and there's always you know, spectacular drone footage, there's GoPro, there's underwater shots and uh, all of it is spectacular but you don't have to have that. As I just showed you in that story um, just previously, you can do things on uh, a fairly simple camera. I'm unsure what Chrissy might have been using there in the depth of field makes me think it was, it was a, a fairly decent camera. But um, essentially, uh, your iPhone or your smartphone these days can be your camera. It is, you know, the, the camera we frequently use in, use in the field for our own uh, news broadcasts from a, a breaking news scene or what have you. So um, the iPhone gets spectacularly good footage. Assuming something is well lit these days, and the camera is steady, you'll get a fantastic shot. The audio is likely to be quite ropey still, but uh, you'll still get a very, very good picture that can be put to ear. So um, if we can just go back a slide there, I think I've jumped the slide ahead there. If we can go back one, Peter, that'd be great. Yep. Uh, to what we want. Um, this is the one thing, if you're supplying footage to us of your field work, uh, we want steady shots. That means uh, it doesn't necessarily mean a tripod, but it means holding your camera steady and focusing on one element for a good sort of five to ten seconds. Uh, if, if you took the example perhaps of a picture in a paddock uh, taking samples, crouching down, we would want uh, the person of videoing them to be a few steps back, holding the camera steady and locking off essentially on that shot. Uh, we also want to in landscape. This is a critical thing. We often get footage into us and it's, it's been someone holding your iPhone in a, a vertical format and that just doesn't work that well for broadcasts. We do see it occasionally when it's sort of a breaking news scene and someone's film on uh, film the tornado or film the sunshine someone will sort of put it in the middle of the screen and will blur the sides, but it never looks ideal. So I'd always, always, always say, hold your iPhone or your smartphone in the landscape orientation, horizontal form, that is the number one thing to do. Uh, and then angles, angles is important. Uh, sometimes we get someone who supplies us three or four minutes of footage and it's all from one singular angle at one distance from their subject. And that is very, very difficult to edit because it doesn't give us uh, much variety in changing from one shot to another and making a, a sequence for the viewer to look at. So if I, I gave you the example there of the person crouching in the field taking some soil samples, what I'd suggest there, um, if you were the person filming, would be start with that shot with the person fil sort of filling the frame uh, and get them doing the lines, then walk back to meters, get a big wide shot, the paddock, give a shot that provides some context Go back another 10 metres, get a, a really long shot, uh, a super wide. If they go right back up to the person doing the science, you know, walk right up to them, get a shot of their hands, uh, let their hands doing the science fill 
uh, the frame, what you're seeing on your little screen. Uh, then maybe film uh, a shot of the little poles they might be filling. Uh, then get really nice and low and get a shot uh, of the grass sort of waving. All these shots, just a single angle. Uh, the camera held steady for five to ten seconds. Uh, then maybe spin around, get one uh, of the rest of space looking at what they're doing. All of the different shots really assist us when it comes to editing. Uh, as I say, if you give us one single long shot, uh, it doesn't matter how exciting it is, uh, you can't really run that for more than 8, 10, 15 seconds uh, without it getting fairly uh, boring. Uh, what I'd say next um, is if we can flip to the next slide, Peter, that'd be great. Yep. Is Oh, there we go. Just don't like, I've already talked about the vertically held um, smartphone. That's a no-no. Uh, Similarly, um, a wandering focus, and what I mean by that is, is someone holding the camera and, fil and sort of filming this fantastic field, work, but allowing their focus just sort of to wander and the camera to go sideways and then up a little bit and then down a little bit and then oh, I shall like I shall go I'll go to the right and I'll do a bit of that and then ah oh, I'll swing over this way and then oh, one second of this and then I'll give four seconds of this. All of that becomes really difficult to edit. That's sort of quite Orientating to the person editing it, let alone the viewer. So it's sort of best to be firm in your mind about the shots you want and to choose one selectively and then choose another uh, and then choose another. And that can mean, you know, turning off your smartphone for a few seconds or pushing stop and working out what you're going to do and then doing another shot and then pushing stop again. Better than rolling for three minutes and and trying to do everything at once, all from a fixed position, and ending up with a jumbled lot of shots. Um, the thing I'd say is selfies. Um, people sometimes like to hold a camera on a selfie ang angle and give sort of a video tour of their research station or where they might be, their laboratory, uh, with them filling half the frame and sort of giving a, a commentary and a guided tour. There's nothing wrong with that for particular types of video. It works quite well on YouTube and blogs and other things. But for us, we really just want uh, the footage that can include people in it, of course, doing the science. Uh, but we don't want that selfie type angle with someone uh, speaking to their audience. That becomes very difficult to edit and looks quite odd on a television broadcast, especially if you have the, the journalist uh, speaking over those shots. You have a, a person on screen sort of um, opening their mouth and talking, which is what we call fishing uh, in the industry. People sort of mouth open, but uh, no words uh, being able to be picked simply because we're doing the talking over them. Um, the next thing I'd say is music and graphics. Uh, this is something we get all the time from people, even uh, experienced people in the industry, comms people, video teams. Uh, we get a musical soundtrack over their, their science um, and all sort of graphics and subtitles and strange transition between shots, dissolved and the like. Um, and we really don't want any of that. We really want the simple, raw, basic product. We want the natural sound, whether that's a, a running stream in the background or uh, an explosion going off, or, or even if it's nothing remarkable, even if it's just a bit of a wind noise, uh, we want that audio. We don't want uh, music. And there's nothing wrong with music and graphics for a YouTube video or for a corporate video or for a blog. They might really have the spot and be just what you need. Um, for us, though, we prefer the unedited raw vision um, that gives us the most license to work with it, and, um, the most sort of leeway. Um, also say, um, talking to camera, um, it's done all the sort of things I've already talked about and you've got some fantastic shots and by all means, um, you have a chat to the camera and maybe explain what you're doing. Um, but if, if there's too much of that and it's, um, it, it's, if there's too much of that, it sort of becomes difficult to work with, particularly, as I say, because the oil on a smartphone can be extremely average. You do need to be quite close to them sometimes to get um, sort of audible speech coming through. I'd say don't bother. I'd say if, if you were being supplying this footage to uh, us or to uh, another media outlet where you expected them to do an interview with you on camera, similar to what you saw in the 
the story about the giraffe weevils, I'd say don't bother with the talking. Um, for us, we'll bring our camera, we'll do the interview, uh, we'll ask you all the questions that we're into, interested in. Um, it's more the, the footage that you're taking that, that we're keen for. And, and especially, I guess, just to emphasise, it's the footage uh, we want is the stuff that can't be recreated. It's the stuff that you did maybe a year ago. Maybe you're not ready to talk about your science yet. Maybe you want to wait until the paper comes out. Good. But, you know, the footage when you're in the field, um, you know, make sure you've got that footage for us to refer to later because all too often, um, once your paper's out there, it is too difficult to recreate uh, the science. You've put away the equipment. You've done the work, you've done the tests, uh, you can't just pull it out again. And for that matter, we don't really want to see you recreating it. We'd rather see you doing it real. Um, it adds a layer of authenticity, and um, that's that's really what we want to, to see. Um, I guess I'll just finish up by saying, um, basically, just do it. Um, when you're out now, if you've got a video camera, fantastic. If you've got a, a point shoot with optical zoom, great. Um, if you don't have those, then as I say, get out the smartphone, just take the shots. If the footage comes out poor um, and it doesn't work for a broadcaster, no harm done. Um, but it's best to have it there. Uh, that at least gives the journalist and uh, the, the media outlet the option of using it uh, should they wish. So that's pretty cheap. For me. Very much well, great advice there. Uh, keep the questions coming. Thanks to those of you who have submitted some, but keep them coming and we'll answer as many as we can. So that really is the, um, the view from, from journalists and from the outlets, what they're looking for. We're going to hear from a researcher who has given back herself, it was gone a couple of years ago, and created a very effective video. We're going to roll that video first and then Heidi's going to talk to how she put that together, what she learned through that process.
thank everyone for tuning in and giving me the opportunity to give you my perspective about um, creating that particular cat video. Um, this is not a definitive how-to guide for science video production, but just as mentioned, my perspective here um, a few differences in what we've heard from some of the previous panelists. Um, they're a lot quicker than I originally anticipated. I had no idea how long it would take to produce a video of this sort. And the reason that it came together with the support of the Science Media Center was that I wanted to enter a science video contest called 180 Seconds of Science. So that really dictated the length of the video, needing to be three minutes long. Um, we did that over about a week. Not full time, just an hour here, an hour there, some time for filming, and maybe a bit of editing in the evening. But as mentioned, I, I did think it would take a lot longer than it did. But it was a really fun process. And the process, um, what I started out with first was obviously thinking what sort of content that I wanted to include in the video. But I started with an outline, and it was very, very similar to if you were starting to write a scientific publication or to prepare a PowerPoint presentation for a conference. So thinking of that introduction and, and what the problem is, why it's important, and why your audience should care about that particular issue. So to kind of lay all those particular things out. I tried to flesh out that outline and sort of write down those key points that I wanted to make. And then I recorded those to help um, a communications team at Victoria University. So at that point, I had several different um, clips of things that I wanted to include in video. And at that point, we really needed to edit. And I'll just give you an example of how I set that up. Again, this is just um, what worked for me, so you may have a, a different system that works. I tried to put together um, the clip and sort of move them around in order and think about what sort of bit, um, visual I wanted to accompany that audio. Unfortunately, I got to this point, um, as I had a three-minute video to create, but I had recorded about 18 minutes of audio at the, and really was exhausted because I didn't know what I was, obviously I was going to have to cut out quite a bit of audio and still have it make sense. So this was one of the challenging parts for me was to shift all those boxes around in the table put things down to the second and um, figure out the best way would it work. And also in that process, this entire video was made with the iMovie program, and I was absolutely fascinated by that. I had never used it before, but it found uh, quite easy to work with, and I did have someone who was able to give me some advice as well. But it was just phenomenal what um, somebody with no experience was able to do and zoom in on photos and overlay all sorts of neat stuff. So very impressed with the iMovie applicant and definitely highly recommend that. And your recommendations, we'll move on to the next slide. Um, I work very closely with the Victoria University communications and marketing staff. And if you have something like that within your organization that you're able to tap into their expertise, I would highly recommend that you take advantage of that. Um, the wealth of information that I wouldn't have been able to do it without them. I think of at the time was the use of still photos, but I've got one of my favorite ones there from our CAT CAM project. I was fixated on video that um, I forgot that I also had all these wonderful photos. But as you can remember from that video, there, there are quite a few still photos in that. And with the iMovie um, program, we are able to sort of zoom across some photos. So we did that quite a bit with screenshots of those cat maps, kind of zooming in or zooming out on the really big maps. And I found that did make a really big difference to make the video more enjoyable and easier to understand. So just on, on video, definitely keep those still photos in mind. And as you heard from Will, collect them as you go, video or still footage, because it is hard to recreate them after the fact. Also very good, the still photos for your PowerPoint presentations at conferences. So just if you're doing a smartphone, you never know when it will come in handy. Just 
film editing, and that way you've got a nice collection of stuff that you can do at the end. Jack, on your video is absolutely crucial. As I mentioned, I had to cut out 15 minutes of audio and still have something make sense. So I end that past a number of people. Um, especially most important to run it past people who are not familiar with your project in the slightest to see if they are able to get a comprehensive understanding of, of what you are trying to convey. Um, you all may have some funders that you may, um, as part of a funding agreement, you may need to have this approved by them. So definitely keep that in mind as well. Um, and sure that you listen to that feedback because uh, that last thing on the slide of, of using proper or consistent equipment. Um, you get some feedback from Peter Griffin of the Science Media Center that is about a minute 17 into that video when we see some fluffy cat paws going down the stairs. Um, very obvious that I used a different microphone because I went back the second day and recorded that particular piece of audio and then spliced that in afterwards. But it's uh, very obvious that it is different. It's not consistent with the audio that we had before. As mentioned, I was trying to meet a deadline to enter the science video contest, so I said, oh, yeah, great, thanks, Peter. I'll keep that in mind, and I'll you know, get on to that, and I'll fix that yeah, when I get around to it. But here we are at the science video seminar, and I still haven't gotten around to it, and we're all watching it again, and I do sort of cringe every time I see that. So just give yourself the trouble and listen to that feedback, and uh, yeah, just get that consistent all, all across the back. Overall, a really enjoyable experience and grateful to everyone who made it possible. Okay, well, thanks, Heidi. And so, sorry for hassling you about the audio, um, but we'll get there in the end. We'll get some new uh, audio overdubbed on that, I'm sure. Um, okay, so we'll move on now finally to Baz. Baz, are you with us online? No, audible. Well, that's fine because Baz, quite appropriately, has submitted a video, a cell that he's taken, uh, it's going to play, and he'll be here for the Q&A at the end. So let's roll Baz's video now. Hi, Baz.
Is that Baz impressively done in one take as well? So hopefully we've got Baz uh, iron to answer some questions in the Q&A. We'll move to Q&A now. As I said, if you do have any questions, any of our speakers, please enter them in the Q&A uh, uh, on the right-hand side of your screen right now. To kick off uh, with the Q&A, this, this is probably one that um, a lot of scientists really grapple with involved in the applied sciences such as cellular or molecular biology, genetics, biochemistry, uh, or, or in the case of uh, Alexander who submitted this question, plant micro interactions. How does an approach work if you're obviously not expert in video or animation? So making the real abstract and complex simple. Um, I'd maybe start off with, uh, with Asher or Will. What's the, what's the advice you have when it's something that might be a model, for instance, or um, something that isn't computer going out into the field and recording something. What's the best way to try and get that across? Yeah, I'll answer that one um, for a start, if you like. I think that goes back to uh, to mine, and Will made the point as well, uh, that we can we can use stills and into video um, from, from an online perspective, so long as we've got those descriptions of what we're actually looking at, uh, how it's relevant, why we should care, um, all that kind of thing, we can pull together and actually make a decent little online um, video clip about it. Um, we're the same for broadcast, and you just put your voice over under it. Um, and, and for things that are difficult to see, um, we can also do animations. Um, you know, if we, for things like planets, um, we can do animations as to mm. Any trend scientists might have observed, uh, we did one a little while ago um, showing how ground tracing radar works. Uh, our, our animation and graphics team isn't massive, but if we talk to the scientists ahead of time, uh, we can work out how to do sort of an animation uh, and recreate ones we find on YouTube in our own style as well. Um, and if it's a big topical science news event that we're doing a story on, then there's every chance that the BBC or... Um, USABC um, might have done it as well, and they're all of our partners. So we can, if it's a story of the day, we might be able to find um, animation. Is that word lost? Yeah. There you go. We've lost someone there. Was someone's on transfer or something? I think they're gone. Sorry, John Will. Um, me. Um, so uh, essentially, yeah, um, if you have an idea for something which needs an animation which can't be easily filmed or photographed, and then talk to us and see what our animation team might be able to cook up or what might be out there on YouTube that we can uh, recreate. Um, but yeah, animation and graphic skills are probably uh, more than the annual average piece of work to so, uh, um your expectations are probably um, slightly grounded. Okay, so that we've got a question here about um, use of video that might be generated by a scientific institute or an individual researcher. That video that, for instance, runs on the staff website, does it become the property of us? What's the deal around copyright? No, not at all. No, no. Uh, not and at all. Ongoing use of it. Yeah, if you give us permission to use it, then we'll uh, we'll do our best to um, to run it as, uh, as as high up the site and as prominently as we possibly can. But the uh, we uh, it gets tagged when it goes into our system as uh, not being uh, Fairfax owned owned um, uh, piece of, uh, of vision or, or still. Um, we absolutely still hold the rights uh, to all of that, and we would never sell it on uh, to make any money out of it that way. I will here. I'd agree with that as well. Um, we might be used footage again for a, a broadcast down the track, whether it might be a year or two years later as sort of stock footage, but again, we wouldn't sort of claim any ownership rights to it. And um, if it was for single use only, then if, if that was stipulated, then um, we would adhere to that. We always put a, um, a credit on it as well. Um, if supplied the whole video, um, your credit would go down the, uh, the bottom. Underneath it if, it, if it forms a part of a wider video, um, we can always put a, an on-screen credit to that as well. Okay, similarly, just related question here about um, use after the fact, maybe several months or years down the track. 
can researchers or other institutions put conditions of use around something if they're concerned that it might be used out of context, uh, just as a bit of B-roll background footage? I, I notes, for instance, you can annotate go with in your archive that say, hey, they need used under these sorts of conditions. Absolutely. Simple answer to that one. Whatever permission you give us, uh, stick to that. If you don't want us to use it again for anything else, we just uh, were removed from the archive or marked as do not use. Yes, well, I'd agree with that as well. We've got video researchers who catalogue all of our um, video, and if there's any conditions um, attached to any of it, then they note that in the archive. Uh, technical question here, and we've talked a bit uh, during Heidi's video about audio. Audio quality is really important. Question about uh, iPhones in particular. Is the well, microphone going to be good for most occasions, or should you invest in an external mic for the iPhone? So I don't know if Baz is, is, is mm, online. No, I'm, 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 I'm part of the conversation. I've been listening. All good. Oh, so you can hear yeah, Baz. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, look, there's a, a can. There's, there's two kind of mics that we'll go over in these workshops coming up at the end of the month. Um, there's the, the, best, uh, the best microphone by far is a little Rode lapel mic that's easy to use for smart devices. Um, they'll also work on 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 Android as well as on on, on Apple. Um, and there's also a little plug-in directional one, again made by Rode. They're probably the leaders in the market at the moment, so not as good. As, but then again, you don't have leads and cables. And if you're just grabbing something on the run, or if you're out in the field, it's a big uh, fluffy on it. One socket. I was just waiting around a few minutes ago. So that makes them pretty cool and 10, 15 knots of wood, because wind is your <coughs> your enemy. But you should know how to get the best video out of just your phone too. So. And, that, and that's a matter of getting out of the wind, getting your light right, composition right, but making sure that the, the silent killer's uh, are not around and making sure you haven't got a, a wet road slicking in the background or a bus or a, a pneumatic drill going in the background. And so there's a whole bunch of stuff you'll learn about audio um, in, in two ways, really, at these workshops. One is um, how to get the best out of what you've got, just with the phone in your pocket, and also how to how to get some really, really good audio with with, with authority and gravitas in your interviews through using a, a, a lapel mic and probably a directional field mic with a little fluffy on. So, yep, you'll suss all that stuff out in the workshop. Okay, maybe just another uh, technical question, maybe, Baz. Um, you talked about in your video about the iPhone, a great platform, iMovie. Heidi was using iMovie as well. On the, on the Android platform, there's going to be people coming to these shops and shooting video with Android smartphones. What's your sort of go to couple mm. of apps? on that platform. Mm. Sure, and I'll just pop them in on the um, text Q&A box here too. Um, KineMaster Pro and Filmorgo, which you can both get from Google Apps, Google Apps uh, are probably two of the best. They don't, they're not they're not really as good. Um, I, I kind of, you know, the, the works you run a real sort of shoot, edit, and load all on a device, and some people, for example, with Will and Ash, often they just want really, really good uh, well shot raw footage that they can then process. Um, so there'll be a bit, there'll be a bit of both. But and the Androids, you know, some of those Androids phones shoot amazing videos, uh, better than the Apples in some instances. It's just that workflow. So yeah, Kenny Master Pro and Film a more ago, um, this of which is just up in the text box. Have a look at those if you've got an Android. They'll work on some Android phones, not on others. So it's it's an ongoing um, cake fight to find a really robust edit app for the Androids. And often people that shoot on Android phones just um, into a computer and, and do it old school, which is put up on a on a on a Mac PC using whatever Adobe Premiere or iMovie, or whatever. Yeah. Thanks, Baz. Question here for Heidi. So obviously, Heidi, you created that for the 180 Seconds of Science competition, submitted for that. But did any media outlets pick it up and use that footage as well? Um, yes, absolutely. There's always been a large media appetite for cat research, so I've been very fortunate in that regard. But yes, it did lead to some additional context. So it was, however, very uh, nice to be able to have a video turn out the way that I wanted to, because after uh, in, in news, it always is uh, a little unpredictable at times. So it was quite fun to have a video, which I was able to edit and be in control of the final product. Follow question just there on the editing process. So you work with the comms team, you talk about iMovie. How did that work? Were you sitting over the shoulder of an, an editor who was working in an iMovie, or were you hands-on doing the editing yourself? 
So the editing was done by myself and a wonderful gal from the communications and marketing team at Victoria University, and I had zero experience with iMovie, and she had some experience. So we just basically sat in the office with a cat walking over the keyboard and figured it out ourselves, and we're really pleased <laughs> with um, the, how we did what to utilize. Thanks, Heidi. I can keep the questions coming. We'll get through as many as we can, uh, as long as you can stay here. Um, okay. Interesting question. Um, what's the best way to tip off a reporter like Asher or Will that we've made this kind of video media release and that they make it bigger to be out of Twitter, Facebook, direct email? What's the best way to guide us off to this great content they're creating? I'd say next. We've got um, a really good uh, email address there, news tips uh, at Fairfax, or is it news tips at stuff? I can get that to you. It's on the website as well on pretty much every story. Um, that goes directly to the newsroom, um, and that's being monitored by uh, by our reporters all day, every day. Um, so they they definitely get picked up that way. Or if you're um, in the industry as well, straight to them. I have my details and stay online, uh, but there if anyone can contact me. Feel free. Um, I'll find an email there. Um, even if it's just to talk about what sort of footage you could get if you're about to head out or doing something in the laboratory, um, if, if you want to to talk about your options, just feel free to get in touch, no problems. Um, sort of get a little bit of this, but another question for sciences that are not particularly visual, would an expert explaining to camera with some graphs be at all interesting? Clearly it won't make TV, but worth doing so maybe for social media or those online platforms where people can post directly to like YouTube and Vimeo. Yeah, doing, I think. Um uh, Will made the point before that you know you you can always shoot it. Um, if if it gets used, then great. Uh, you know someone might pick it up, but if it doesn't, no harm done. Um, and, and, and again, it might come down to what the topic of the research is and what the graph is showing. Um, to have a graph, or, or is there some other way of telling the story? We have a lot of archive footage mm -hmm. that we can draw on that might be exactly what you've. Um, been looking, maybe it isn't, I'm not sure. Um, maybe just sound us out. There's lots of different ways to tell stories and, you know, TV, print, video, what have you. Question there about the Science Media Savvy Science Video workshops we're doing. So we've got uh, one in Auckland, yep, one in Wellington as well. They're both pretty heavily subscribed uh, at the moment. But a uh, question about South Island, would love to bring them to South Island. Um, so we've done them before in, in Christchurch and Dunedin. So uh, come and talk to us if you'd be willing to host uh, a workshop, and we can get Baz there um, and hopefully have yeah, a couple sure. of centers. So um, you know, definitely get in touch with us about that. Uh, similarly, a question around science video competitions. So obviously there was the great 80 seconds of science uh, competition. So as I know, there's a good chance that that will be run again this uh, year. Um, so that's actually right up in Australia, but they have an across the ditch category, which um, had a lot of entries uh, last year. So hopefully that will be continued. And there are other competitions going on within universities. I know the, um, the, the MESA, which is the student organization for the McDiamond Institute, they run their own one, and, and lots of the universities do as well. So that is actually a really good impetus to do a science video, to start working on one. With these workshops in Northern and Wellington, Baz is actually going to carry on beyond those workshops and mentoring people with the aim that everyone who goes through these workshops actually has a crack at producing their video. So Absolutely. if you have a competition deadline in mind, this could be a very good way to prepare for it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm aware of the handful of workshops Convita used to run, um, um, sorry, Competitions. Convita used to run competitions with first, second, and third prizes for exactly these kind of things, no longer than three minute videos, uh, with significant, you know, several thousand dollars, you know, five thousand, ten dollars first, first prize. I did that with the faculty at the University of Auckland. So I'll, I'll just, I'm nice to judge those. Um, I'll just check with Convita to see if they're still doing that because there's, I think there's a handful of them dotted around. So I'll, I'll round off all those possibilities and have them for the workshops. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Did you hear about measuring impact? Uh, obviously, um, researchers and really like to be able to show how many eyeballs have been on their work. Is it possible if a researcher or an institution collaborates with a media outlet to actually get some metrics on how many people viewed that 
there so they can report back to their institution on the overall impact that it had. Uh, within stuff, it's a, there's a general policy that we don't um, we don't release um, that kind of um, sensitive data, uh, you know, to the masses. But I'm sure if we're actually working with somebody directly on a story, um, you know, we'd be able to work something out. I'm sure. Um, but I mean, even if it's a, I know you don't like, uh, you know, general sweeping statements, but we can definitely tell you whether or not it performed uh, at a high, uh, middle, or low level comparative to other stuff on the site. About working uh, on an individual basis, really. A uh, question here, uh, interesting one actually. Just wondering about mentioning or explaining lab animal work in science communication. What are the perspectives from a media point of view? I think sort of getting at an interesting issue around the ethics of uh, animal testing and that type of thing, and some of the sensitivities around that. Is that something that either of you, Asher or Will, have have encountered? I've had similar um, issues arising, uh, arising with sort of um, uh, genetic um, sort of work, and um, I, I, I don't think any news story is going to go very far if it becomes a debate for showing a particular shot or not. Um, it's difficult to say. Um, it's probably in any story about animal lab work to explain the importance of the work and what needs to be done to it. To achieve some sort of outcome, um, I guess it depends on what type of work was. Um, it would just be good to speak to the research maybe on a one-to-one -one basis to find out more about what animals we're talking about, what sort of work it is. Um, yeah, I guess I can't be clear if I knew more about what the example was. Okay. A uh, question here for Heidi, which is about the process of gathering all of that. Uh, footage and the graphics, the GPS overlay and all that sort of stuff. Any tips on managing that workflow maybe over a long period of time while you're gathering all of that material? Where, how do you store it? How do you categorize it make sure you can make sense of all of that stuff when it's time to actually edit together a video? Uh, thank you for the question. As mentioned, I just um, gathered everything and just put it in a Dropbox file. and. When I got around to it, tried to organize it, thinking, "Oh, this might be good for, you know, this particular usage or things like that." A lot of the footage that we saw in the, from the chat perspective was actually from a different project from the GPS one. It was from one with the apps wearing video cameras on their collars, which I had done previous to it. <laughs> but it was able to be sort of split in seamlessly to give us a sort of cat's eye view of things. And, and more of an idea about where they were wandering and what they were encountering through their eyes. So um, again, and even though it was from a different yet similar project, we were able to use that to um, accompany audio in that particular science video. Thanks. Okay, yeah, here's a, another question. Quite a fundamental question, really. How can we as scientists recognize something that make a good story, I, I something that we should film. So, there from the video experts, or Heidi, maybe your perspective as well, um, as someone who's, who's been through this process, what do you look for? How do you so to be keeping an eye out for for good stories? Any tips for identifying material that could be used later on really effectively in communicating research? Heidi, I'll start with you. Okay, obviously, if you're trying to explain your your methodology. Anything visual that you can use to complement that audio would be useful. For example, with the GPS project, I had a lot of background footage of me simply putting a harness on a cat in case I ever needed that for a media interview. Um, it's very simple bits of your, of your methodology, which may not seem very important at the time, but does come in very useful at a later date. And as mentioned in the previous question, just sort of trying to organize those into different folders in a Dropbox type storage. Um, to see. Yeah, my computer's just full of cat photos and videos, basically, and, and I know where all of them are and I know what uses they are. So, yeah, just, just trying to stay organized with what you have and, and being able to pull that out when you need it. Uh, Asher, Baz, any suggestions there, practical things for, that researchers can do to spot good story ideas? I'd like quick um, I think you know, as, as a scientist, um, you're really excited about something. You 
genuinely quite excited. And it's almost it's like you need to make that uh, human connection. And, and what I've sort of given you a few, a few tips and tricks here, and I'll certainly give you a, a whole load. And how, so if you find it exciting, somebody like me who's not a scientist, how, how, how would you approach that with me? How would you put it in layman's terms? How would you break that down? And, you, and of course, we're, we're talking a visual medium, a visual medium. So, you know, how could you show that? Um, so you might need to think sideways. Well, I'm excited about this. Um, you know, you're interested in, 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 in exciting and energizing other people about this. How, how do you do that? But it's always a, it's a human thing. Where's the, where's the human angle? Yeah, I mean, animals, we love animals, you know. And, of course, if you're talking more testing, that, that's... You know, do we do we test animals for the greater good, or you know, poor Fluffy, she's getting chopped up on the table. Um, you know, it's kind of it's, there's a great there's that classical reality conflict and activity there. So, um, yeah, is, is there a human interest story? You know, um, I know that's a broad sweeping thing to say. I, I think um, it can make. I, I think a good test also is um, when you're telling your friends and family about your research. You know, do they like that? Do you find get a constant stream of questions? Is your interest in what you do? And, and if the answer to that is yes, then I think you'd you'd be wise to maybe pitch it to a wider audience. Uh, and I think for anyone, um, get in touch with the guys at the Science Media Centre because they will have a very very handle on what will work uh, and what won't, and they'll be able to advise you on uh, perhaps what format works. Maybe it won't be video, maybe it will be uh, a different uh, type of media, whether it's print or radio, but they'll be able to talk to you about how to maximise um, your tiny story. Yes, mm. just on that as well, um, there's a couple of tools that uh, I'll send out to everyone which we use uh, in our, our Science Media Savvy courses. One is very simple but very effective. Tool. It's called the message box, and it's a little device that allows you to really think through the core of your story and then ask the obvious questions, the so what question that the public will be asking when they watch this video, identifying the problem, the solutions, and the benefits to society if that solution um, bears fruit. So there's, there's, that. there's also storyboarding templates as well to allow you to, on paper, just visualize how you think the shots could be put together. I think the experience that we've had is the more work you put in up front on paper, the easier it's going to be when it's to the point that you pick up your smartphone and, and start taking some footage. So that, that's definitely something we'll be um, drilling into in the workshops as well. Just a couple of final questions. One, this is an interesting one, about the use of humor in communicating or research. And there was an element of that in, in Heidi's video, sort of quirky there with the, the cat on her lap. Um, uh, in her office, a, a, a different sort of element to, to the video. What's your views there on, on the use of humor? Obviously, the, the videos that go viral tend to be quite humorous ones that really appeal to, uh, to sort of um, things everyone has in them that everyone wants to laugh. The work, is that something they should be thinking about when they're yeah. uh, generating videos for, for things like stuff for TV and Z? I absolutely agree with that. Um, you know, it goes back to one of the points that I made at the very start. It's all about making it accessible, accessible. And if you make something funny, you're going to get you know a, a lot more traction with it. Um, you know, people will share it a lot more uh, on their social media platforms, and it just gets to a much wider audience. That said, you know, you're going to have to be, uh, you know, it, the the humour has to fit in with what you're uh, what you're doing. You know, if it's something overly serious and you're trying to uh, get a laugh out of it as well, you, the reaction from the public might go the opposite way. But um, in general, I would say, I would say yes, uh, humour does work, uh, and, it really, and, and, and it works yeah. well on a on uh, you know for staff's audience. Yeah, a bunch of workshops, guys, with um, with health interest health boards and what have you, ran, ran on yesterday. Exactly. It's only humour. Even when you're just dealing with something reasonably reasonably serious, don't lose and not necessarily the open ha ha sort of humour. It might just be an excitement and engagement, uh, wry aside. You know, it's, it's yeah. It might not be. You know, it's things that are mild, you know slightly taking the piss uh, of yourselves and, and what you're doing. Um, um, I'm not suggesting you can do that, but but just an element of yeah, energy, excitement, intrigue, a little bit of mirth will always assure that those things are, you know, and, and you know, like I, I mentioned Barbara Breen, uh, you know, with, she's this little dynamo from AUT and she just lights up on camera. She's excited and passionate and the buzz is eyes and she can't help but infect the viewer with that too. Um, humour definitely, that's one of, that's one of the main, main tools in your kit, yeah. Okay, thanks, Brad. Uh, and just, just finally, a sort of 
for a practical question really, is it better to aim for one big hit uh, video and submitting a video to a media outlet or is there scope for a series of videos exploring, for instance, a issue like fresh water or climate change? Are you interested in SES as opposed to uh, one hit uh, on a video? I think it works best for us and it goes well. Uh, you know, then there's there's always going to be an opportunity, I'm sure, for a follow up later on. Uh, yeah, you've got an opportunity to get your, your to get as much information as you uh, across as you can, and that initially it's better off for you. Oh, as well, I think maybe there's a room for a series being hosted on your institution website or, or on you, but um, probably for media, most would probably um, a one off experience uh, initially. Um, they would probably want to commit to a series uh, on something with one particular individual. I, I wouldn't imagine. Okay. And look, just finally, one's just come in. Um, best is for communicating in the health sciences space. Are there any real sort of go-to issues uh, to illustrate health science stories that you think work particularly well? I'm not sure on that one, Will. Do you have any ideas? Um, with science stories, we often like to relate that back to someone at home and how the story can affect them or their loved one with X or Y conditions. So if you are doing a study with, if we're talking human treatments or human medicine, um, we'd normally have to film with someone with the affliction that's being looked at. Um, if you're doing tests with that person, we'd like to get for there's often big ethical issues around that and lots of disclaimers and forms and it might be a blind test we're talking about so perhaps not possible but um, if there is that opportunity then that can really bring a, uh, a medical area to life and can just humanise it and sort of help mm. explain what it's about and can also be good especially if you're talking about a topic which is difficult to show on camera if we're talking about um, you know, internal human body and things aren't easy to show um, if, if we can go actual people and have them discussing and talking about um, how the condition has affected them, then uh, that yes. that goes a long way. A couple of quick, quick things here. I'm, I'm doing a lot of work, like I said, in the, in the health sector, not just running smartphone videos. Um, but we, we make patient experience videos, patient journey videos for Weissmatar and Canterbury and, and, and counties Monaco, DHP. And they love it. They're, they're really happy. And we're doing some really quite moving stories. We have people on camera that are, that are very upset. They're in the middle of oncology issues. And we're talking about their journey through the hospital. And these started as like training feedback. So for these health boards at high, you know, five to eight thousand people each. And so and and now they're they're, re they're real little standalone mini docos really. They're just some of them are really strong stories. We've got, um, you know, a, a young girl who was a young boy, transgender story. We've got Aussie stories. We've got people that are, you know, nearly died, and we've got people that have died, and their family members are, you know, um, with rainbow case. And these are really strong stories that, are, and some of our talent uh, have okayed these to be in the public domain, and they're getting lots of hits. So there's a, there's a real, real interest in in the health boards now and, and clinicians getting human feedback from their clients, which is, you know, in the old days you go to a doctor or a hospital, they'd do it to you, off you go, take these pills, bugger off. So so now there's kind of this real sort of feedback interest in, well, how is it for you? <laughs> well, not very good, actually. All fantastic. You know? And so they're great stories. And exactly, well, it's a, the human, if there's a human element there, then, and they, those those triggers can then lead you into the science behind that oncology, you know, oncology miracle or this or that or this new development or this new initiative that's working so well and it's got a total science base. You know? mm. People, where's the people? people where's the people? Yeah, mm. absolutely. Okay, look, we'll, we'll wrap things up there. Um, thanks so much to our speakers, Asher, Will, Heidi, and Bass. Thanks to Dacia for running the briefing. Thanks, thanks so much to all of you for attending. This webinar is going to be recorded, so we'll send a link so you or, or any of your colleagues can play it back. We'll also send the contact details for um, for Will and Asher, and uh, also for Baz, who does a lot of these workshops around the country and can tailor one for the needs of your organization if you'd like to, to do that. Now, if you're interested in attending the Auckland or Wellington Science Video Workshops, the application is closed in May on Friday, so go to sciencemediacenter.co.nz for all the information on how to apply. And as I said, I'd love to hear from you if you'd like to organize one uh, in your uh, region as well. We'd love, love to get to the South Island later in the year. 
Um, thanks again for tuning in. Expect a follow-up email from us with the recording link and all the other information. Have a great afternoon and thanks for joining us. Cool. Thanks. Bye.